And, um, so we're starting on the, and heading towards the last topic in um, membranes. So we're starting on reverse osmosis today. We've uh, wrapped up microfiltration, ultrafiltration, essentially as two of the major membrane application areas. And now reverse osmosis is by far one of the largest market segments in terms of value. And so we should be spending um, some, some time understanding what reverse osmosis is about. Just before we get started though, two administrative issues. Of course, as you can see up here, the assignment three is returned. Um, please collect them up at the front. There's also some of the older material here if you uh, missed out on picking up an earlier assignment. Um, and then the second topic is related to the course project. And um, let me also mention that assignment four is going to be delayed a little bit because I'm involved with a few administrative issues and I guess you've got uh, other things going on as well. So use this time though to work on the course project, at least start to get a preliminary research plan going. It's only a small eight page report, but it covers topics that are not directly taught in this class, right? So we've, we've learned about some of the material covered in the project, but the project is a chance for you to extend your knowledge outside what we cover in this class. So use that time to at least gather references and start some readings behind the scenes. Um, so, so let's take a look here at reverse osmosis. As I said, it's one of the largest markets in terms of size. I'm going to show you some flow sheets and some numbers to um, get a bit of the engineering insight. But also in today's class, my goal is to just understand a bit of the theoretical concept of what osmosis is. So osmosis is a Greek word uh, push, and you'll see why that um, comes in a minute. So this is, this is the important concept that we have to understand in order to understand when, uh, terms we're going to see later on. Imagine you have two bodies of water, pure water over here on the left and then sea water on the right. So there's dissolved salts and we can just use NaCl conceptually for now. The membrane is a reverse osmosis membrane here. And the pore sizes on that membrane are incredibly small, nanometer size. Small enough to allow the solvent, water, to pass freely through but no solids will pass at all. In fact, we don't have any solids here in reverse osmosis. This is a critical point. Uh, someone was asking in an earlier class, what about fouling on a reverse osmosis system? We clean up and pre-treat our water, so we have no solids here. Seawater, there's no sand debris in this material. This is only dissolved NaCl. So if you look at this visually, you can't tell the difference between these two bodies of water other than the dissolved salts. And the dissolved salts are in this side in the seawater at a higher concentration and essentially zero over here. And this system is not at equilibrium. Okay. Because the membrane allows water to pass through and nature senses an imbalance in concentration, we have a, at the very least we have a concentration driving force at this particular instance. So that concentration driving force will, uh, will lead to a change in the system so that we reach what we call osmotic equilibrium. Okay, this is not total equilibrium. This is only osmotic equilibrium. So we have, what do we say, osmotic pressures balance. And let's take a look at what that's doing. In order to balance that concentration difference or to try and get that concentration difference balanced, we're going to try and dilute the, sol the solutes, the dissolved solids on this side, on the right hand side. So to dilute that, we will see that water travels through the membrane from left to right. And in doing so, what happens is that that level here on the right will increase. There's your initial level. So this will increase by that level and that will drop by the corresponding amount. And it will keep moving over until such a point where we really can't balance the gravitational difference. So we get this head difference set up, rho g h, rho g delta h, we call that from second year fluids. Rho g delta h is the pressure difference that we can support by sending water up this channel. Till such a point that now we've got mechanical equilibrium. So 
we've got this water pushing this way, CP naught on this side, so we get this push of pure water over to the right, and we have this pressure down corresponding, so now we're in pressure equilibrium. These two pressures are balanced, okay? Is that clear? That's the, that's the understanding of osmosis. This is not reverse osmosis, this is just regular osmosis. Osmosis is this idea of push, remember it's the Greek word push, so it implies that there's pressure. And so we're seeing two pressures being in equilibrium here. The head difference, rho g delta h, versus the osmotic pressure being pushed, pushing this way. And this is how we can measure what the osmotic pressure of various salts are. Okay, if I change this salt for a different one, I'll get a different osmotic pressure occurring. This is a key point. The osmotic pressure is not a function of the membrane. I can put a different membrane here, a different RO membrane made from different material. As long as this is water and seawater, I will get the same difference in heights occurring. Okay, it's not a function of the type of material used for the membrane. Why is the water being pushed? Because if we start here at our initial case, we sense a concentration imbalance. And to try and counteract that, we're going to try and dilute that side. Okay. So now let's look at what reverse osmosis does. Reverse osmosis takes this a step further. And let's go and put more water on this side. So fill up the right-hand side with more seawater. So create a higher pressure on that side. And what will happen is that your solvent will pass through the membrane. The membrane, remember, we call it sem semi-permeable. It allows the solvent, but not the solute, to pass through. So the solvent can pass through and will move in this direction to try and get back to that equilibrium state we had there earlier. Okay? So that's the critical principle behind reverse osmosis. Now, And there's basically a verbal description of what I've said. The key things here are osmosis is a thermodynamic property. It's not a function of the membrane. It's only a function of the fluid and the solutes that are dissolved in that fluid. Okay. And you can derive this osmotic process uh, equations from a fairly complex set of thermodynamic calculations. But that, the net result is what we're going to use here in today's class. Now let's take a look at it a little bit in nature. Okay, so in primary school and high school, perhaps, they may have taught you that the way that fluid gets transported from the roots in the ground up to the leaves is through capillary action, right? That's actually not true. It's through osmosis that, that occurs. So it's not capillary action. In fact, capillary action, if that was the mechanism, the maximum height that trees would grow to is 10 meters because that's all that capillary action can sustain is 10 meters at atmospheric pressure. And we have trees of much greater heights than that. Okay, so the reason why we can get water up to our leaves is through osmotic pressure. Um, other okay, cases where we see osmosis in nature is cells. Cells, and the cell is a membrane. It's a semi-permeable membrane. It allows material selectively through the membrane surface. So if you go and do something like put salt on a snail, Right, and the snail's surface is a membrane, what's going to happen? Think of this case. You go, there's the membrane, the, the snail's body. You go put salt on the snail or the slug. You've created a concentration difference, and you're going to dehydrate that snail, and that's why they, they die. Okay, so same idea for fish. If you put a, a fish that's, that's body is and cell is used to fresh water in a salt water tank, uh, that fish will die. Um, if you can try less dramatic experiments at home by peeling potatoes and putting them in salty water and regular water. And what happens if you put potato in the salty water? What will happen to that? Compared to the potatoes that are in just fresh water? It will shrivel up, okay? So after a while, and the salt concentration high enough, you should see that potato uh, shriveling up that's in the salt water. Okay, so 
Uh, so reverse osmosis then is essentially saying if, and, and what you should start to see with this illustration is that reverse osmosis is a counteraction of osmosis that occurs in nature. So we can't get past nature's ability for osmosis. Nature is always going to be pushing in this direction. So if we put our salt water here and our fresh water here, nature is going to push in that direction. Our goal is to create fresh water. So when you think of reverse osmosis, the goal that you have in mind is desalination. We're trying to take seawater and create <coughs> fresh water. We want this to be the opposite way around. So reverse osmosis tells us essentially that if we want our net direction to be in that way, in that arrow from right to left, we're going to have to apply a pressure there on the right hand side that exceeds the osmotic pressure. And what we'll end up seeing in today's class is that our driving force required is now not only the delta P that we've come to see in membranes and filtration before, we now have to take into account the fact minus osmosis. Okay, so we have to overcome osmosis. Osmosis works against us. We have to apply a pressure difference that is the value of the osmotic pressure and more in order to get the net drive from right to left as shown in that illustration. And let me perhaps give you an equation that will illustrate just how much that, that is that we're going to have to do. So if you want to calculate the osmotic pressure, osmotic pressure is pi through some thermodynamic manipulation and a few very minor and, and uh, approximations, the osmotic pressure is a function of the number of moles of ions. This is important. It's not the number of moles of the solute. It's the number of moles of ions that you have in solution. So if you dissolve sodium chloride in water, you, have, you don't have, let's say you've dissolved 100 moles of sodium chloride in water. You have 200 moles of ions, 100 moles of sodium ions, 100 moles of chloride ions. So your total molar uh, moles is 200 moles of um, ions then in that instance. So be, be careful of that N there when you're calculating. R is this gas law constant, except we're going to use it in a slightly different set of units that you're used to. But this is by convention in this area. T, the temperature, and Vm is the volume of solvents associated with the solutes. So if we take N over V, number of moles divided by volume of solvent, that's a type of concentration. That concentration C is moles of ions per meter cubed. So here's a quick calculation. I'm going to give you a minute or two to get used to this. Um, take 0.1 moles of sodium chloride. That's one teaspoon, a very small amount of salt. You dissolve it in a liter of water. That's quite a bit of water for, for such little salt. And prove to yourself, uh, use your calculators quickly, and prove to yourself that you get about five atmospheres. So five atmospheres. Remember from your uh, fluids flow course, one atmosphere is about 10 meters of head. Okay, so this is 50 meters of pressure head that's generated by such a small amount of salt dissolved in water. Okay, it's pretty, pretty substantial. So go ahead and, and prove that calculation to yourself quickly. We're going to use this many times, so let's get some practice here quick.
high pressure, it doesn't necessarily mean the concentration is equal, right? No, they won't be because the membrane only allows the solvent to pass through. So you can never, never get equilibrium. Uh, you can't get, that's why I say it's, it's osmotic equilibrium, it's not total equilibrium. Everyone get that number, 4.9 atmospheres? Okay, good. So, um, so that calculation is one that we're going to use several times, as I said. Now, let's um, take a look at some other systems. If you take a look at pure water, it has no osmotic pressure. There's no solvent. Uh, sorry, there's no solute. So that concentration, pi equals C times RT, there's no moles of ions per meter cubed in pure water. Okay, so an osmotic pressure for that is zero. This is the answer you just calculated um, now. 4.56, a little bit different to the 4.9 you just calculated. And the reason is um, that's approximate. Okay, so this is a good approximation. The true thermodynamic derivation is a lot more, more um, complex. It, revol it relies on activity coefficients and um, the complexity is not worth, um, worth the accuracy that we get, but there's the true number for, um, for that amount of salt in water. Two moles, 96. So this uh, scales linearly, as you can see. You double the concentration, you double your osmotic pressure. Seawater is in the order of three and a half weight percent of salts. Okay? So seawater is not just NaCl, there's a mixture of salts in that. And this osmotic pressure is done by measurements, not theoretical calculation. So 25.2 atmospheres. 25.2 times 10, that's 250 meters, a quarter of a kilometer of pressure head developed by seawater. That's already starting to illustrate the tremendous amount of operating costs we're going to have to spend to desalinate salt water. Okay, we're going to have to overcome 25 atmospheres of pressure before we just get to equalizing osmotic pressure. And then we still have to drive our material through the membrane. Okay, so tremendous uh, pressures that we're working with over here. Just a word on that 3.5%. If you're dealing with 3.5 weight percent and you want to convert it to uh, the equivalent molar amount, so moles per meter cubed, remember that's 3.5 grams of NaCl and then you divide through by 100 minus 3.5 grams of H2O. Okay, so assuming salt water, seawater is pure salt, that would be the calculation you do, and then you start to use the density of water and the molar mass of sodium chloride to get to the molar concentration, which is what you're going to need in order to calculate up there in this equation. So. C is the moles of ions per meter cubed. So if you want to convert weight percents to molar concentrations, that's the mechanism you use. Okay. Now, as I said here, um, reverse osmosis occurs when we, our pressure gradient that we apply exceeds the osmotic pressure. So we're going to have to do um, some extra work. And I'm starting to give you some idea of what that is. When we were looking at ultrafiltration um, in Wednesday's class, the sorts of pressures we were dealing with was 10 atmospheres um, or 1 MPA. When we were looking at reverse osmosis, uh, that can be as high as 8 or 10 times that pressure. Okay, so these are bigger pumps, stronger pumps, and more uh, energy costs associated with that. Now... There's a new difference in, that we're going to start to look at here. In ultrafiltration and microfiltration, we assume that our solid, that solute, does not pass through the membrane at all. In other words, our permeate was pure, pure fluid. We're going to change that assumption and make it more realistic. So if we um, draw back this diagram that was up there on the board earlier, and I'm going to exaggerate my membrane a bit, so this is my membrane over here. The true, the true um, concentrations are as follows. 
So my vertical axis here is concentration. And if this is my feed side, and this is my permeate side, our concentrations are as follows in a reverse osmosis system. We have your sodium chloride, for argument's sake, let's just use sodium chloride over there. So this is that concentration in the feed. And as we approach the membrane surface, we see an increase there very slightly, similar to what we saw in ultrafiltration. There's a small concentration build up there um, of those salts. And then that salt, we've always assumed in prior topics in membrane, does not pass through the membrane. But in fact, in osmosis, reverse osmosis, it does. So if we're looking at this vertical axis over here where that's zero concentration at the bottom, I'm, I'm superimposing a plot on top of the geometry of the system here. There is a concentration gradient through this membrane. We do have salt passing through the membrane. And then there might be some drop off there. So there will be a small boundary layer effect. And then this is my concentration in the permeate. Okay. <clears throat> Now what we'll typically do is we'll assume that this is approximately constant over here, C feed and C permeates. There's a very small gradient there. So essentially there's only two concentrations of interest here. There's this concentration here on the feed side and the concentration on the permeate side. Okay, now let me take this a step further. We have a pressure difference. You've got your pressure here on the feed side. <clears throat> and you have your pressure on the permeate side. And the pressure on the feed side is, of course, let's look in the direction that it moves in is in that direction. And there is a pressure on the permeate side in the reverse direction. And that's in fact what we've always called delta P. Is the feed pressure minus the permeate pressure. <clears throat> Let's try to understand, though, which directions the osmotic pressures are in. Any guesses for which direction pi feed is in? So there's an osmotic pressure due to the concentration of the feed being greater than the concentration on the permeate side. This way, right? So we've got it. The osmotic, oh, not perm, feed. <clears throat> okay. There's an osmotic pressure because of that concentration of feed being greater than the permeate side. And pi feed is the pressure due to that. And we have another osmotic pressure. In fact, because our permeate here is non-zero, we have an osmotic pressure from the permeate side to the feed side. Much smaller, of course, because our permeate concentration is so low, but we have this permeate pressure over there. Okay, and so what we'll then do is call this delta pi the change in osmotic pressure as pi feed minus pi perm. 
Okay, and then if we calculate our net driving force, our net driving force is given as, so we can say our driving force here that we're going to see as our result of this is the feed pressure minus the permeate pressure then going in this direction so if the feed pressure is in this direction using the same sign convention pi permeates will be in that direction minus pi feed okay. and if we simplify that and write it in terms of these symbols up there we can see that our driving force is equal to delta P minus delta pi. Okay, so this explanation isn't in the notes. Um, it's one that I just came across recently. It's, I thought was better than the one I gave last year. So, um, so that explains then why I have that equation up there, delta P minus delta pi. And we can calculate these terms easily enough. P feed is the pressure of the feed. P perm is the pressure of the permeates. Those are sensors. We apply, add sensors to our system. We measure those two. Pi feed and pi permeates, these are also calculated. Pi feed and pi pi, uh, what am I saying? Pi feed and pi perm, uh, these are... Um, calculated from that equation we had earlier. So provided you know your concentration of your salt here in the feed, which we can measure in the lab, and the concentration in the permeate, which you're going to measure in your lab. Remember, this is your permeate water that you're going to send out as drinking water. So you're going to do laboratory tests on that to see how much salt has been left over in this. So these, these salt concentrations are very easily measured with instruments. And so we can then calculate what that driving force is. Any questions on this so far? That's the core theory around reverse osmosis. So then uh, perhaps at this time, let's just, before moving on, just understand a bit about, yes, sorry, Brandon. So let's ask what happens if we increase our pressure drop through here. So we're going to then force more material through the membrane, right? So then you're sending salts across. And that also that works against you in, in some way because you're now sending more salts through. But it does, it does defeat you. You start to get the, the osmotic pressure working against you even more so, okay? So yeah, it's not, it's not, it's not an, a, a, a trivial way of, of operating these systems. Okay. And that's in the GE, um, GE handbook that I posted on the course website. There's some really, really good stuff in there. Maybe before I move on to that, uh, this, this GE handbook that I'm referring to here, um, there's some really neat, neat information in there that I think is worth reading about. So for example, what I like about this handbook is it's written in a very frank, uh, non-scientific way. So for example, the guy talks about how to start up this process this is a, a ultrafiltration process with feed plus bleed that we looked at in the last class. And here it says, here's an example how not to start the plant. A lazy operator places nails in a piece of wood to turn all the pumps on simultaneously. And then he talks about how that actually damages the membrane because it just clogs it up instantly. So then he talks about how you should start it up. So a lot of practical good information in there. Something else that was really interesting um, is how pressure affects flux for various types of membrane, so the pressure flux relationship for RO, nanofiltration, ultrafiltration, and microfiltration, um, and in explaining why that is. And then this is the key interesting part, how to optimize the plant operation. Some really good practical information in there. And then finally, um, something that we're looking at now is costs. How much do these membranes cost? Um, so there's prices per meter, meter, cubed, uh, meter squared of membrane. And then further on, he has got prices 
um, for LMH and fluxes. So, um, so a real wealth of information in there that you, you don't find anywhere else. But um, let's just quickly go back here. I want to just look at the economics of, of these systems. So here's some estimates for us that the RO market is in the order of $3.8 billion in 2008, estimated to be $5.6 billion. A lot of uh, work and employment in treating water. Some further um, applications here are, it's not just desalination, right? Uh, there is a, that's a primary driver for this market. But a, a really other important market that we see in Canada, where we have ample fresh water, right? In Hamilton and many cities in Canada, we can drink our tap water um, untreated right out of, out of the tap. It comes at a good quality. But we cannot use that water that we take from the municipal system in our industrial plants. But if we start to feed that into our boilers and our heat exchanges, we start to get scaling. So people in 4N have been looking at this. Um, those of you that are not in 4N, what happens is when you boil water up, you start to precipitate salts out at a, after a certain temperature. And those salts will cause fouling and damage on your heat exchanger surfaces and on your boiler surfaces. So membranes are used widely in industry in North America to demineralize water before it goes into the boiler circuit. So that boiler circuit, we recirculate our water, our steam inside a plant. We don't just use it and dump it back into the river. It's recirculated, and so um, we don't want to avoid a buildup of minerals from that. Um, it's also used in ultra-high purity applications. A really interesting one is the really high degree of purity that's required of water in an electronics manufacturing industry. But if you think of electronics semiconductors, the whole principle of semiconductors is impurities in the silicone that makes the semiconductor work. So when you're manufacturing and depositing the layers in that uh, chip, you need water with absolutely no impurities, or as low as you can get. And so they spend a huge budget on getting that water pure. Um, it's used in these other areas, fruit juices, tomato juice, citrus, apple juice, dewatering, dealcoholization of, of um, those. And what's really interesting and why membranes are used here is what's the other way to dewater juices and apples and tomato juice and dealcoholize wine? What would be one other alternative if you wanted to dewater? Heat, okay, apply heat. And uh, you've done that in a lab in 4L or in 3L, right? So you can heat, but the moment you heat these materials, you change the characteristics, the texture, the nutritional value of, it, of them. So membranes are one way to achieve that same goal without the heat. Okay? I recently heard that um, a large application area for membranes is in maple syrup. So maple syrup, traditionally, if any of you have been to a maple syrup farm, like a small mom and pop type thing, it's boiling and heating that maple syrup, right? And that's, all of that is, is the latent heat of vaporization that's being spent over there. A tremendous energy cost. So membranes are now being used to try and um, to achieve the same goal with no heat degradation. So a variety of good applications beyond just desalination. Um, I've looked at this uh, example several times, so I, um, I'll actually come back and talk about a different application in a minute. And then I wanted to just quickly uh, pause on this slide. Um, let's take a look here. This gives us some idea of costs. Now this is out of date. This is at least uh, 20 years old. But there's some good numbers on here that give us an idea of how RO operates for a commercial system. Right there we see the pressures required. Tremendous inlet pressures. There's our fluxes, LMHs being reported. So when you're calculating LMHs from an RO process, there's a good value to check your answer against. Is it reasonable? That's typical RO flux. Conversion, let me just quickly uh, talk what conversion is. Liters per meter squared hour. Yeah. So it's flux just converted to liters per meter squared hour rather than meters cubed per second 
per meter squared. Uh, conversion is also called cut. Um, is essentially you take your feed and then you've got your permeate and you've got your retentate. Okay, or as you start to see in some of the other GE documents and other literature when on membranes, they'll sometimes re, uh, rename that as concentrate. So what does cut refer to? Well, cut is essentially if I take 100 liters of feed water and put it through a membrane, so here's my membrane system over here, the permeate stream will be 40 liters and that will be 60 liters. So this we say we report the cut as 40% in that example. Okay, so another way of seeing cut is as QP divided by Q naught using the notation from Mon uh, from Tuesday and Wednesday's class. Okay, so that gives you a typical idea of what you're wasting because in waste in, in desalination applications and in reverse osmosis applications, we're not interested in the retentate stream. We send the retentate back to the ocean or back to the source that we, we obtained it from, and it's the permeate that we're interested in treating. So that tells you how much feed you have to treat to get a certain amount of permeate is your cut. Now, what's interesting is that anyone who's bought these home-based reverse osmosis systems, so you can go to Home Depot and other places and buy your own RO system to pipe in into your home plumbing, the cut on that is in the order of 7%. Okay, how wasteful is that? Right, because it says that every 100 liters of municipal water you're taking, you're only going to get 7 liters of drinkable water, and you're basically wasting the rest back down the drain. Why would that be the case for home treatment systems? You're not able to achieve the pressured gradients that commercial systems would achieve, right? So in a home-based system, you're relying on the municipal system's feed pressure to drive the system. And so you get a tremendous inefficiency with that. Okay, so if we look at the household RO costs, um, let's just put those numbers in units that are more typically used. Seven, doll, uh, seven cents per liter that's $70 per meter cubed, okay? Or if you're, if you're op optimistic on the low end, that's $15 per meter cubed, okay? Now, if we take this commercial system over here, the total cost is $4.7 per thousand gallons. Um, if you do the unit conversion on that, a commercial system is able to achieve back in, 2000, in 1992, so 22 years ago, the economics of that is $1.25 per meter cubed. Okay. So far more favorable economics if you're doing this at a large scale using big scale pumps and treatment facility. Your home-based RO is ex incredibly wasteful and expensive. So once we start breaking down these costs, you can start to see what goes to capital, what goes to operating. It's a pretty much a 50-50 split. Um, where do your operating costs come from? They come from energy, primarily energy, to drive that. There's membrane replacements, chemicals, labor, and other that go there. Where do your capital costs come from? Direct costs. This is the equipment that you're actually buying is the vast majority of your costs. And then when you start to ask what is indirect costs, and you Google it, you get some really interesting information. Um, so this is uh, worth taking a look at. Just wanted to share this with you. Um, if you look at in a RO system, so indirect capital costs refer to project engineering, developing the project, and project financing. But there's another important cost here is public participation. Whenever you're building a desalination plant, you have to involve your people in your neighborhood around you. And so there's tremendous costs, legal fees, um, 
and dealing with the public that we don't typically see in engineering, where you're just building a chemical plant. So there's a far greater public participation in these waste wa in water treatment facilities. But what I did want to spend a little bit of time on was putting RO in context. So let's take a look at this flow sheet. There's some, some interesting information in here. So we'll start, um, start out here at the bottom where we're taking our water in, our seawater comes in. We have a pumping station that's providing our first pressure. And this starts to tie in a lot of the um, topics we've seen earlier in this course. So right up at the beginning, coagulation and flocculation. Why is that? Why would we want to do that first? Take care of the solids in the feed. The biggest problem with taking seawater in is when there's a storm and it's churned up the water and now you've got all the salt coming in or a boat rides past that intake, you now have all this crap coming into your, um, into your intake over there, right? So you want to get rid of that seaweed of, of any debris and flocculate it out. The last thing you want is that going through your membrane surface. Um, so let's, whoops. So from coagulation then we now have flocculated our material and we want to then separate it out. So we've got a, a gravel bed over here essentially, uh, multiple layers of, of gravel and sand and then we take our filtrate supplied. So this is your low pressure liquid that's mostly cleaned up now, almost, yeah. And two interesting things take place over here. You've got your pumps that provide your pressure now, that's your delta P on your feed is being provided over here. Two additions, sodium bisulfate neutralizes chlorine, okay? So if you can neutralize any of your ions in, in, in the solution, uh, less work to be done. So that reduces chlorine, sulfuric acid to balance pH. Some cartridge filters just to get rid of any final debris in there as a final catch -all. And then your RO pumps to supply the high pressure. Let's take a look at this bank of reverse osmosis membrane. So I showed you a video in the prior class that illustrates how just one of those units are made. We saw the detail and the complexity of the membrane, the spacer, and how that's all wrapped into, um, into a spiral over here. So we take our high pressure feed, come in, it's split parallel, right? We covered the reason for why we have parallel banks in Wednesday's class. We split all that feed up and it enters through these headers over here. So here's a bank of headers. Your permeate will pass through the membrane and is collected into this central header pipe where it moves on and your retentate or concentrate as it's called here um, leaves. So let's, um, let's just follow the, the retentate stream for a minute. You've got your retentate leaving, passing over here. And this is something new that I haven't spoken about yet, energy recovery. Right, so you've got this very high pressure of feed coming into your membrane and this concentrate is still under pressure. There's a great deal of pressure there. So what you would want to do is try and recover that pressure energy in some way. You don't want to just take this concentrate and dump it back into the ocean. It will eventually get there, but because it's pressurized, we want to see if we can recover that pressure energy in some way. Well, that's an interesting challenge. How do you recover pressure from a fluid? Right? And um, there's a number of interesting patents and designs around that topic that have emerged over the past few years. And I've posted a video link in the course website that shows you a, an animation of how that works, how you can move that pressure energy from the concentrate to your filtrate supply, in other words, your feed. So you repressurize your feed and the energy is recovered in that way. So that feed gets recycled. You have to boost it a little bit though and then it, it, it gets recirculated again. The concentrate or the retentate that's now depressurized um, goes out here and we just pump it back to the ocean and discharge it. Let's follow the permeate stream. Uh, permeate stream comes here. Now this is mostly drinkable water. There's some post-treatment for bacterial um, purposes and pH pH stabilization to a drinkable point and then we store it and, and 
feed that to our municipal water treatment system. Okay. So a lot of ideas and concepts from this course, from 4M, uh, coming together in this flow sheet. Now, this document, and again, I'll post the link to it, has, um, has a lot of detail about capital costs. Here, this talks a bit about overcoming public um, opposition to your plant and dealing with that. These are these indirect capital costs referred to over there. Um, so a lot of it is more of interest to people taking 4N. A lot of these terms will make, it, make sense to you. But here, let's get a, an idea of um, another aspect I wanted to emphasize that's important to this course and is understanding how we might design these systems. So here, here's a slide that indicates that we have to go through a pilot phase. A pilot phase is an intermediate step between laboratory, very small scale, single person operation, and the big plant. So here, this is a nice slide because it illustrates the scope of a pilot plant. Um, you've got these tanks. These are movable. You can reconfigure the piping here. It's a fairly flexible structure to, um, to change the system around and try various configurations. And what they're talking about in the slide is testing why would you why would you do the pilot step? Well, you want to confirm that you can get the LMHs that you're promising the municipality that you're building this for. Okay, that's another interesting point. Your biggest customer for desalination isn't another company. It's a municipal body or a governmental body. Okay, so they're the ones paying, paying for it. So you need to be able to, um, to prove that you can get the LMHs that you want or that they're looking for, that you can handle high and low temperatures, dissolved solids, that you can handle algae, that you can handle storms and heavy rain, that you can handle boat traffic and other dredging operations that cause turbulence in the water and change your feed condition. Okay, so that's, um, that's about piloting and then uh, the rest of it is, is more monetarily related. But there's one number in here that I wanted to get to and that is the cost. Where did it go? Um, is it further on? Okay, yeah, this is the one. Capital costs. So this is in Algeria. This is in 2013. So this is more recent data and uh, why I wanted to go through the slide. So this is home, home RO. This is commercial RO that was in 1992. Let's take a look at what the technology now is. In 2013, we're seeing costs of 70 cents to a buck 10, okay, per meter cubed. So it's come down a little bit. The technology has improved. It's back since 92, but you're seeing now what the cost of that water is. On a, to on a total basis, so taking the capital and the operating costs into account. Okay. So a question here for you, is desalination appropriate for a country like in, in Central Africa? Right, so a, a country that's maybe on Lake Malawi, there's water, not in good quality drinking, will they be able to afford that price? Okay. Do they have the energy to supply to implement RO? Okay, so there's some challenges there re related to reverse osmosis. Sorry, question up here for me. What is the LLB? Is that for nine meters per day? Yeah. Megaliters, yeah. Did you um, concentrate into the like, local salt concentration in the water um, Okay, good question. If uh, by dumping this concentrate back into the body of water, does it affect it? In the ocean itself, no. Um, but in a smaller lake, it may well have some impact. Um, that you, you'd have to take into account through a mass balance, which uh, we have a lot of good hydrology data to then recalculate what we're doing to the environment. Yeah. Okay, so, um, so what I hope you got from this class is a sense that there's tremendous potential for anyone looking for a career in this area. There's a lot of interesting stuff that you can do with it. There's a lot of interesting economics that go behind it, not just engineering. Um, so what we'll do in next class is do some RO calculations and then we'll wrap up this topic of membranes up next week.